I want you to know the Lord's going to be passing by today. He wants you to be saved. He wants to change your life. The world may have told you you're used up and wasted and there's not anything good in you. I want you to know the Lord sees so much in you. He gave his son to die for you. That's how much he loves you. It's unbelievable. But that's the reality. We, hallowed, we praise God and say hallelujah for all that. Genesis, if you'd go there with me. Our theme continues. We look at in the beginning God and Genesis 25. We come uh, to this morning. We're uh, back after Christmas uh, to where we were. And I'm excited about this message. Someone said the most significant contribution we make in life is passing the passing of our faith to the next generation. The most significant contribution we make in life is the passing of our faith to the next generation. Warren Wiersbe said, no generation stands alone because each new generation is bound to previous generations, whether we like it or not. That's the truth. Many of you here are over 40. I won't ask you to raise your hand. If, if we all stood right now, we could tell because when you stand up, you oh, right? that's the only thing you know you're over 40. When you sit down, oh, right, you make noises up and down, right? But I joined your ranks this year and uh, I'm over 40 now, too. And we are having now children born and young people coming to the world and growing up that will one day look at us and talk about us as the generation that came before them. There's a new generation, a next generation. We're going to find in Genesis 25, twice the word of God is going to say the generation. A new generation is coming on. We've already preached on this. I'm not going to preach on it already from uh, today from Genesis 25, but Abraham dies in this chapter. What, what a patriarch, what a beginning. The guy that God chose to be the beginning of his nation, the nation of Israel and the, the father of the faithful. And, and what a man, Abraham, what a man of faith. But all men come to the end. And Abraham, his time, he served his generation, and his time is up. God has called him home. When that next generation rises up that will call us the generation that came before, what will we leave them? What will they say about our generation, about the generation that we live out right now as Christians. Uh, we think about the generation even in our church. What will be our legacy? This is our moment. Uh, we will not have another time. There's no reincarnation. We don't come back. This is our time to live for the Lord and make our stand for God in our day to earnestly contend for the faith. We see here in Genesis the next generation step on the scene. Notice beginning in verse 7. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived 103 score and 15 years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. And his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah's wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt by the well of Heroi. Now these are the generations, notice that, of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, and he goes on now through their names. Twelve princes we see in verse 18. Notice verse 19. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and he goes on. And so I want to think of this thought and this title this morning. We're going to be in Genesis 25 and Genesis 26 uh, primarily, and we're going to kind of do an overview. We're going to come back and preach some of the stories of Jacob and Esau and things that we see here. But right now we're thinking of and focusing on this theme and this thought from these two chapters on the next generation. And that's the title this morning, The Next Generation generation. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you as we stand here on the beginnings of 2024. We think about the year that is ahead of us and 
the building that you're doing, this new church is being planted and uh, Lord, uh, what you want to do here in this church and, and with needing more space so we can minister to the people you've given us and to the people you'll add to us. And we think about the next generation of Christians that will stand up and step out in faith for you. And Lord, that we that are in our strength will be the generation that will lead the way. That will leave a legacy like Abraham of faith in God and of building altars, if you will, that will represent that we were people of God. We were ones that worshiped the one and true God that lived and died for us and rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave as our Savior and our wonderful shepherd. And Lord, I pray in this service that you would stir the hearts of your children, of the saved, and Lord, the ones that are here that are lost, that you would stir their hearts to become your children today. They would know your wonderful salvation. Glory to your name. Move, we pray, in this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, I want you to see, first of all, this morning, a generation of infidels. Ishmael here. Here is a generation in verse 12. And it's interesting, as you go through the book of Genesis, the Holy Spirit, through Moses, He's the human author, human penman. The Holy Spirit has him always pick up the godless line, uh, pay, take care of the, the, uh, the collateral lines, and then get back to the line that God is going to stay with where the story continues. Very interesting. You see that with Cain in the very beginning, Cain's line first, and then it goes to Seth and, and God, the godly line, the godless line and the godly line. We see that here with Ishmael, and then uh, he, he's going to pick up Isaac. But Ishmael, verse 12, the Bible says, Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son. A generation of infidels. Here's a generation that discarded the faith of dad and mom. We're living in a generation like that in our world. In the last two generations, we've seen that in especially. You think of Ishmael's parents, Abraham and Hagar. Now, we must know a lot about Abraham. Abraham, we've been preaching about. But both were pagans who were saved as adults. Abraham and Ur, no doubt, worshiped the moon god and the Ur of the Chaldees there. And he had to put away those gods and put away those things and come out and follow the one and true God. And he did by faith. Think of this. We know the story of Abraham. What a study we've been studying. But then the story of Hagar. And of course, we preach several messages. It's an amazing story. Uh, here's a, no doubt, when Abraham and them went because of the famine down to, down to Egypt, they got this Egyptian uh, handmaid, a uh, slave girl. And here she is uh, now in Abraham and Sarah's life against her will. Uh, she is taken, of course, away from Egypt at the famine ends and is with them. And uh, you know the story. We're not going to get into all of it, but Sarah can't have children. So she gives Hagar to have a child and Hagar will have Ishmael. And, and, and out of that, of course, while she's expecting uh, with this baby, um, Sarah is, is upset with her and, and deals hardly with her. And so she runs away. And as she runs away, she had seen, lived there for at least some time. We don't know how long. And she had seen Abraham that worshiped God and seen the altar and seen a man of God that was, that was a good man and a man that God was working through and had promised great blessings to. And yet she leaves that place. No doubt she thought no one cares about me. No one knows where I'm at. She didn't have a cell phone. She couldn't text. She couldn't call. There was no Greyhound bus or airlines. Here she is, maybe thinks she's going to die in the wilderness. Maybe she thinks she's going from a bad place to a worse. She doesn't know what's going to become of her. And yet God appears to her. Oh, what a story. The Lord appears to her and speaks to her and she names the place and it means thou God seest me. She knew God knew Abraham and knew Sarah and she knew these knew God. But God, you care about me. You see me. You know me. You feel the infirmity of my heart. You know what I'm dealing with. And she puts her faith and trust in the Lord. The all-knowing God is real and he cares about each of us and loves each of us. And this is what Hagar finds out. He knows me. 
He sees me. I want just to say, stop here for a moment and say to you this morning, he knows you and he sees you and he cares about you. I've met some new here this morning. Others of you have visited before and are back and some of your regular attenders. I may not know your name, but I want you to know God knows your name and he is, sees you and loves you and wants you in his family. It's nothing to do with joining this church. It, it's nothing to do with baptism. It has to do with you putting your faith and trust in the Lord. But I want you to know what the devil in this world will tell you, you're not important and you can't be everything and you're insufficient. Our God says you are of great value to me for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He loves you for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you don't know Jesus, your savior this morning, he delights in saving sinners. The Bible says there's joy in heaven and rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that comes to repentance. Think of that. You could ring the bells of heaven this morning if you're lost here and you get saved. That's how exciting salvation is to the Lord. He loves sinners. For the Son of Man has come, the Bible told us, to seek and to save that which was lost. He came for you. And all you have to do is receive. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. Yes, you deserve death and hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you would recognize this morning, yes, you're right, Lord, I'm a sinner. I repent. I turn from my sin that will end me in hell. The wages of sin is death. I turn. I repent. I turn from that. That's what repent means, to turn. I turn by faith to you, Lord. You did die for me, and I believe that. You were buried, rose again, and I want to receive you as my Savior. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Romans 10, 9, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And I just want to, right in the beginning, give the invitation that you could be saved today. You can be saved right where you're sitting there. In just a minute, we'll have an invitation for you to come forward. We'll have a man with a man or a lady with a lady take a Bible. And if you have questions, we'll take you in a private room and let, help you from the Bible to know you're saved. And how you can know this morning you can receive everlasting life. Hagar, she realized that. She understood this. And Hagar was as much a believer as Abraham after her encounter with the living God. You say, well, how do you know that? Her belief changed her behavior. She had left and ran away and God met with her and said, go back. And she did. Changed her. Turned her heading this way to heading that way and heading back to where God said. And what a privilege. So Ishmael, this is why she's expecting. So Ishmael is born to a believing mother, one that has met the Lord and says, he sees me and knows me. And Abraham, of course, is well known in the word of God. And we've studied him, a believing father. And he loved Ishmael. He was the only boy in the home, only child in the home until he was 13. And think of the attention and the care and what he saw with Abraham serving and worshiping God and, and, and Hagar now knowing the Lord. And of course, Sarah that knew the Lord. And it was Ishmael's remarkable privilege to have been born to a home where the truth of God was known and obeyed. Amen. Think of it. He was born to a man who is known for all time in the scriptures as the friend of God. That <laughs> talked to God. That knew the Lord was God's friend. What privilege. This is handed to Ishmael. Here it is. What privilege. What will you do with it? Some of you, you would say, I did, grew up in a home much, much different than that. I didn't even hear the name of the Lord Jesus except as a curse word until I was this age. And you could share your testimony. And you would say, what a privilege it would be to be raised in a home like that. He had that privilege and it was handed to him, but he had to make a choice what he would do with it. A generation receives from the generation before, but they themselves must make a choice to follow the Lord, to believe the Lord for themselves or not. Here today in 2024, our opportunity to serve God in this year, what are we going to do with it? God has allowed you to live. Some of us thought we'd never live this, this year, but you have. Here you are. Congratulations. You've lived to 2024 and have enough health and strength to be here today. What will you do with it? What will I do with it? What a privilege. Ishmael has two saved parents. 
Abraham, one of the greatest Christians of all time. Hagar is newly saved. The excitement of that new saved. But it's, she's seen God. And Ishmael grows up watching dad build altars and worship God faithfully. Sacrificing to God and obeying the Lord. And, but instead of receiving Christ as his Savior, he mocks at the Lord's plan of salvation. Turn over to Genesis 21, just a couple chapters back. Look at verse 9. Here, Isaac has been born, the promised son. Look, this was no secret. Everyone knew. And God had continued to say this to, to Abraham. And then when Hagar is, is used like this, and, and, and God says, no, through Sarah will come the promised seed. And through him will be a blessing to every nation. For all time, I mean, this was obvious from, they knew this from Genesis 3, that, that there was going to come a Messiah. Now they know it will come through Abraham's line and through this nation. And so Isaac is born. And it's not about Isaac, it's about the Lord Jesus is going to come through Isaac. This is another link in the chain that will lead to our Savior that will remove the sin of Father Adam and Mother Eve that has come on to all of us through their bloodline. We need a Savior. And that's, of course, how they were saved in the Old Testament, just like we're saved in the New Testament, by looking to Jesus. They looked forward to the cross and the promise of the Messiah and the promise of the, the redemption plan and the price paid on Calvary. We, of course, look back to it is accomplished and it is finished now. And the promise has been fulfilled. But the same salvation, same way through the Lord, by looking to the blood. That's why they sacrificed the lambs as a picture leading to the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. But Ishmael in Genesis 21, 9, instead of rejoicing in the salvation that was for him as well, by the way, verse 9, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Here's a, a toddler. He's just weaned, verse 8, and they're rejoicing. And he's mocking. He's mocking. Mocking at the promise of God's salvation through Isaac. Oh, the Lord loved Ishmael as much as he loved Isaac. Listen, his heart yearned over this rebellious young man. And as you read the scriptures, Ishmael, chapter after chapter, we see him brought up. Again and again, he picks up his name, Ishmael, writes it in his book, the word of God for all time in the book of Genesis here. And then seemingly, sadly, lays it aside, puts it back down again. Ishmael, in spite of all the advantages of his birth and training raised up in Abraham's home, wanted no part of any Messiah and mocked. Look, Ishmael is without excuse. I think of my friend growing up. We graduated high school together. We were a small Christian school like here. It was a class of two, <laughs> a big class that year. He was in my wedding. There were three kids in his family. He was the only one that uh, went to the Christian school. And he, his mom could afford it when he was younger. And then the other kids came along. And, and uh, he eventually paid to go to the Christian school himself. Other people at the church got on that and helped him with it. Graduated all the way through. Had the same training I had. The Christian school would go out. Many times him and I went door knocking together. We had teen soul winning on Wednesday nights like we do here. And we would do that. But now, I tell you, say this with tears and heartbreak. He's an infidel. He says, if my children want to learn about God, they can ask or go find out. But he doesn't take them to church. They live in a godless home. All that was handed to him. All that he experienced. Look, no one has a perfect home. We all can make excuses about something else, but the privilege that he was given and now living completely godless, living like God does not exist, living like this life is all there is. I'm praying for him. His own children are not in church. Unless something happens in his life or their life at God's mercy, his children will die without Christ and go to hell. After all that privilege and opportunity, Look, someone could go to Genesis 25 here and play devil's advocate, if you will, <laughs> and say, hey, this isn't fair. He wasn't God's choice. It's not fair for Ishmael that he wasn't the one. And look, that's not reality. All of us must submit to God's role 
in his great plan. Now listen, even the Lord talks about that in church, doesn't he? I mentioned this in Sunday school, the eye can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. Or the hearing can't say to the mouth, I don't need you. No, every part is important and every one of us have a role to play. And, and, and God loved Ishmael and he should have rejoiced and encouraged what God's plan was. Let, let me show you, in fact, the best example of this, I think, in the Bible. Go to 1 Samuel 18 with me, please. Just a minute. We'll come right back. Look at 1 Samuel 18. I think is the best example in the Bible, or one of the best, of submission to God's choice and God's role for you. We know the story. Saul is the first king of Israel. Saul has a good son. His name's Jonathan. He's a good son, a good boy, has a heart for God, says, I'll do anything for you, David, whatever you want. We're going to read that in just a minute. And when he meets David, he loves him like his own soul. And he will recognize in time that God does not have the throne for Jonathan, who was the crown prince. He was the rightful heir, but that's not God's plan for him. He realizes David's God's plan. And instead of like Saul fighting against that and saying, I want to take him out so I can have mine. He says, no, this is wonderful. This is God's choice. And says, I'll do anything I can to help you and support you and encourage you to fulfill God's will for you. And my role is to help you to be able to fill your role for our nation and for God's plan. <laughs> this is the right way to respond when we don't have the role that we think we want or someone else might. No, I'm glad for the role God chose for me. He didn't choose for me that. I'm not prepared for that role, but God has given me this role and I can play it for the honor and glory of God and the great plan of redemption. Look at it. Uh, 1 Samuel 18, look at verse 1. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, what's happened? David has just killed Goliath and came into Saul's presence. Can you imagine carrying the giant's head? Different day. And it came to pass, what a sight though, right? When he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit unto the soul of David. Remember, Jonathan's the crown prince. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day, would let him go no more home to his father's house. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Can you imagine? Here's the prince. David's a shepherd boy. But the prince takes off the royal robe. You can think of Joseph and his robe as the favorite. He takes off the royal robe and takes off his weapon and takes off his, all this and says, you, I recognize, are God's choice to be the next king. Boy, that goes against our world, a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You got to step on somebody to get that spot, do whatever it takes. But he recognized God's will and God's choice. I turn again, look at 1 Samuel, just another chapter over. Look what he says there now at the end of his life. 1 Samuel 20, verse 1. And David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? And he said to him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It's not so. And David swore moreover and said, thy father certainly knoweth that I've found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth, as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Your dad's trying to kill me. That's what he's saying. Verse four, then said Jonathan unto David, whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. <laughs> What a friend. Look, he could have just stepped out of the way and let, let dad kill him and I'll be the king. No, he said, I'll help you anyway. I know God's choice is for you and God's hand is on you. Verse five, and David said to Jonathan, behold, tomorrow is a new moon. And he goes through this thing of what they'll do about figuring this out. Skip down to verse eight. Therefore, thou shalt deal kindly. <laughs> Here's Jonathan saying, Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself, for why shouldst thou bring me to thy father? This is uh, David speaking. And notice, and Jonathan said, Far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon thee, then would, I not, would not I tell it thee? Then said Jonathan to David, or David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me, or what if thy father answer thee roughly? And Jonathan said to David, Come and let us go out. And he says, they, they talk about this plan. I want you to notice down in verse uh, 16. So Jonathan made a covenant 
with the house of David, saying, let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Well, what did he swear? Well, verse 14, and thou shalt not only while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. And so he says, look, I know you're going to be king and I know the normal way for kings. Guess what they do? All the previous royal line, they cut all them off so no one can challenge them to the throne. But Jonathan says, listen, don't kill. Take my life when you have God's role. Hey, I've helped you all this time. I'll help you then. But if I'm not alive, don't cut off my seed after me. And of course, you know, the story He goes after. He says, who's who's still alive of Jonathan's house? I want to keep my word. I want to be a blessing to him. And he gets Mephibosheth. Remember the lame one and brings him to his house. Let's meet at the king's table and shows his kindness to Jonathan, who was so kind to him. One more wonderful example. Turn to John, and then we'll come back to Genesis. What an example Jonathan is of someone saying, I see God's choice, and I want to take my role in God's plan. Look at John chapter 3. John the Baptist is a wonderful example of this. John, John the Baptist here in John chapter 3, look at verse 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizes, and all men come to him. Boom. This is the reason the Sadducees and Pharisees and the scribes and chief priests rejected God, though they knew he was the Messiah. They rejected him because of envy, the Bible says, because of the crowds he drew and they didn't get the crowds. Well, John the Baptist, in our world's thinking, should have had the same problem. This guy's getting bigger crowds than you. Hey, that's what they're telling him. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. That's God's role for him. This is God's role for me. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom for the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth them rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John understood his role and God's will and plan for him. Listen, can I encourage you today? Revel in the role that God has for you. Relish your role as God's will and God's plan and God's choice for you. But don't, like Ishmael, rebel against God's role for your life. He won't be the only one. Esau will do the same thing. Jacob is going to serve the younger. That was said before they were ever born. Esau should have said, fine, I'm going to help my brother I'm going to protect him. I'll be his protector. He was a warrior fighter. I'll be his protector to make sure the, the, the line of the Messiah goes on through my brother since that's God's choice. Not because Jacob was better or because Esau was worse. It was before they were born. That was just God's way, God's plan, God's choice. But instead of helping him to fulfill, he gets angry and Esau rebels against his family. Different story, different day. But can I encourage you, don't rebel against God's role for you and his great plan. Husbands, take your role that God lays out in his word for you. Fathers, take your role. Be the father God's called you to be. Wives, take your role. Mothers, take your role. Children, teenagers in here, take your role in obeying your parents, honoring them. What God's called you to do, don't rebel against your role. Rather, submit to the role God's placed you in. Hey, roles will change. Children, teenagers, you won't always be. One day you'll be the husband or the, or the wife and so on. But listen, Relish the role God made you for. There's wonderful security and peace and comfort in knowing I'm fulfilling God's will for my life. Yes. Look, you think you get to the top, you'll have peace. You think you accomplish something great, you'll be satisfied. You're wrong. Ask anyone that's been to the top. Talk to Tom Brady, see if he's happy. Hey, hey, talk to Peyton Manning. Talk to all these guys that have been at the top. They weren't happy at the top. Because there's no happiness or joy at the top or succeeding or, or, or getting the, the best role you think there is. There's no joy in that. The only joy in this life is found in doing the will of God for your life. So embrace what God has for you. Don't rebel because you think there's grass that's greener somewhere else. It won't be greener for you. It's not God's plan for your life. How tragic when the children of devout Christian believers turn their backs on their priceless spiritual heritage. I know some of you said, I would have given my right arm to have the spiritual heritage so-and-so has. Listen, 
What a tragedy that those that sometimes have it turn their back on it. Like Ishmael and Esau did. Live for, and live for the world and the flesh instead of for the Lord. Listen, you want to know what Ishmael's contributions to the world has been? Back to Genesis now. Genesis 25. Ishmael's contributions to the world. Genesis 25, verse 16. I want you to notice, like, like Jacob, his nephew, he will have 12 sons and they're 12 princes. This is what the Bible says. Genesis 25, verse 16. These are the sons of Ishmael and they, these are their names by their towns and by their castles. Twelve princes, according to their nations. He is going to have 12 princes. Now, I'm not going to read their names and talk about them. You can study them. They're interesting. Uh, they don't help us in this message necessarily. But let me just tell you what history is borne out as the contribution of Ishmael. John Phillips writes this. Like his half nephew, Jacob, Ishmael founded 12 tribes. From these sprang, from those sprang the Arab peoples who have contributed much, perhaps more than most, to the world's culture and the world's cruelty. The atrocious African slave trade was largely the work of the Arabs. The abysmal spiritual darkness of Islam is yet another Arab contribution to the woes of the world. And persistently to this day, Israel's bitterest foes have been of Ishmaelite stock. End of quote. Huh. Think of that. You never know the choice you make in your generation how it's going to affect generations to come after you. Hey, Dad, you don't know the choice you make, the legacy you leave, the direction you set, how it's going to impact your children and grandchildren. What a difference between Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac's contributions and contracts, he gave us or continued, if you will, the worship of the true living God of Abraham, the God of the Bible. And he, through his line will give us the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Not only that, the Jews would come through the Jews, will give us the word of God, gave us the Bible. Wow. Wow. What a difference. Two brothers, two boys, same dad, same home. Here we see a generation of infidels. Number two, I want you to see a generation that entreated. You say, how do you spell that? All right. Look at verse 19 <clears throat> through 21 here. A generation that entreated. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated, there it is, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. You're going to have twins, and Esau and Jacob, and we'll, we'll preach that story in the future. And this... A generation that entreated. You say, why use the word entreated? It goes with infidel, okay? Keep my alliteration straight, all right. But, but entreated just means he's praying. It means to supplicate. Supplication, praying. I want you to notice, and this is very significant. The first thing after dad dies, the first thing after Abraham, besides them burying their dad together, Isaac and Ishmael, the first thing said about Isaac is he's praying. He is seeking the God. Look, dad's dead, but his God is not. I wish I could talk to Abraham. I wish I could get direction again for him and counsel from Abraham, but he's gone. But his God, where he got the wisdom from and where he knew where to do, is still living and still is the same yesterday and today and forever. Hallelujah. Listen, every one of us, if your dad's not already passed, one day dad's going to die. That's just a fact of life. Unless the rapture happens, that's the course. But when dad dies or mom dies or grandpa dies or grandma dies, the Lord, if they knew the Lord, their God is still alive. And you can still get help from the God that helped them. And this is what Isaac is doing. He is, the first thing we're told about Isaac after Abraham's gone, he's praying. He's seeking God. By the way, this won't just be Isaac. It's going to be Jacob beyond him. And Joseph, we see a generation of those that will pray, that will seek the Lord. Supplication is, this entreat, entreated means to supplicate or supplication. It's fervent prayer. And James tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He prays, that's the Lord, to give him a child, open up my wife's womb. And he does. 
she conceives. Verse 21. Can I ask you, what will this generation of Gospel Light Baptist Church be like? We see a generation of infidels, those that would turn from the truth that's laid before them. And we see a generation of those that entreat the Lord, that pray and seek God. Maybe I should ask it this way, what will you be like? Sir, ma'am, what will you be like? We find here in Genesis 25 that a whole new generation must seek God. A whole new generation must believe God. Remember the Bible says in uh, Hebrews eleven six, 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Look, Abraham prayed and sought God, but Isaac could have said like Ishmael, ah, God's not, busy, not worried about this. God's not interested in this. I don't believe that he can do anything about it. But no, Isaac believed that he is. He is the God of my father and he has not changed. He's the great I am. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Like dad sought him, I'm gonna seek him. A new generation must step up to serve the Lord. Another generation must step out in faith and follow God and trust him. Hey, look around. What does Isaac have? Sometimes we have in our mind Abraham and he is wealthy. But let me, let me ask you, what does all that gold and silver get you? They live in a tent. There's no walled cities. They don't own, they're a new nation. But guess who's alive right now of this nation? <laughs> There's four of them. After the babies are born. <laughs> That's it. Look, after Jacob, and he has 12 boys, and years go by, they all go into Egypt, remember, with Joseph, and there's food there, and how many are there now? 70. So it's not like Isaac's living high on the hog. Who cares how much gold and silver you have? There's no mall or Amazon to buy. Okay? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Like, there was no fancy restaurant where he was dining on lobster and steak. They were... They were um, Pilgrims, they were those that re refused the wealth of Ur, the counties and the cities there and l went out seeking a nation whose builder and maker was God and they were seeking the Lord and so they always dwelt in a tent. I don't care how nice the tent is, the tent's still a tent. And so he didn't have everything. You know what he does have? He has the Lord. Hey, Ishmael, his boy's got castles and nations. These are princes Isaac doesn't have any of that. He's living for God. He's not living for this world. He's living for the next. Now, I, I'm, again, I'm not going to take away. He's wealthy and there, there is that. But I'm just trying to help you understand. Look, this is the situation. He is looking to the Lord. He's believing God. Remember, there are 70 and a generation later. Look, everything's not handed to him. He's going to have to trust God and follow God for himself. And can I say this morning on Vision Sunday, as we think about two churches being planted, one here in Hoover and one on another continent in Bolivia, a building that God would have us to start and build here, we must trust and we must follow God too in our day, in our generation. Number three, not only a generation of infidels, a generation that entreated, sought the Lord, prayed, but number three, lastly, a generation is influenced. A generation is influenced. Genesis 26, would you look there? What do you think about this phrase here? Begin in verse 17. And Isaac departed thence and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Don't you think about that phrase for a minute. He called their names after the names by which his father had called them. A generation is influenced. Here Isaac is calling things the way dad called them. You see, he had, he had a good dad. The wells have significant names and significant meanings. We'll look at that in a different message. Uh, back up to verses 3 through 5 of, of Genesis 26. A famine comes, 
God appears to him in verse 2. Go not down to Egypt, dwell in the land which I tell, tell thee of. Verse 3, sojourn in this land and I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries. And thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Why? Verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Here's Isaac's son, who is hearing from God, the same God, and said, I'm gonna bless you like dad, I'm gonna make your seed like, like I told dad I would, like the stars of heaven, the sand by the sea, and I wanna tell you why, because dad obeyed. Dad was blessed because he obeyed God. The blessings of God are found on the path of obedience. He had a dad that was a man of faith and a mom, Sarah, that was a woman of faith. He had parents that had utmost confidence in the word of God. When God called them and said, go to a land, they went. <laughs> they had utmost confidence in the word of God and lived it out. My point here is, dad, when it says in verse 18, he called their names at the names by which his father had called them. Dad, what do you emphasize in your life? Dad and mom, what do you call things? You see, this, this phrase could be positive or could be negative, depending on who dad was. Dad, what do you say about alcohol? More importantly, what's your life say about alcohol? Not your wife, I said your life. <laughs> what do you say, dad, about worldliness? Dad, what do you say about immorality? What do you say about fornication? Hey, what do you say about these things of the world? Or what do you say about surrendering to the Lord? What do you say about seeking God and seeking the will of God for your life? The Bible says that Isaac called these wells after the names his dad called them. Thank God he had a good dad. Can we make the application to us? You see, a generation is influenced by the generation before. We keep reading, verse 19. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, This water's ours. He called the name of the well Esek because they strove with him. And they digged another well and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it real both. And he said, for now the Lord hath made room for us and we shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded, notice this, he builded an altar there. That's emphasis on the word there. And called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. God meets with him and he builds an altar there and he pitches his tent there and says, I'm going to stay here where God is. And I'm going to worship God and walk with God in my days like dad did. Then notice verse 28. Even other people see and they said, we saw certainty that the Lord was with thee. The Lord was with thee. Sounds like Joseph, doesn't it? Isaac is calling on the name of the Lord. He's built an altar here. And, and other people are seeing God is with this man like God was with Abraham. Best, guess what? These are the same people that made a covenant with Abraham. Then when Abraham died, they put in, filled in all their wells, an act of war in that day, in that desert area. But Abraham's dead. But then they say, uh-oh, Isaac, God is with Isaac like God was with Abraham. We want to make a covenant with you. We want to make a peace treaty with you like we did with Abraham because we see that the Lord is with you. Hey, Dad. The place you call important. The place you make important. Your son will make important. So what's important? The house of God or the ball field? What's important? 
Where do you put the emphasis? What excites you? What gets you jumping out of the bed in the morning? What's more important, work or church? What's more important? If you can't quite say, your children could tell you. See, Abraham called on the name of the Lord and influenced the next generation, and now dad is gone. And Isaac is calling on the name of the Lord, and because of that, a generation has the Lord with them. Verse 28. Young people, is that what you want for your life? The Lord with you? Dads and moms here, grandpa and grandma's here today, is that what you want for the next generation? The Lord is with them. Look, you, you might could say, and young people, you may have valid excuses that my dad and my mom or my grandpa and my grandma or these people that raised me, this and that and the other. But I'm telling you, if you're here today and the sound of my voice, you have a choice to serve God and seek the Lord. And God's word is true no matter who your parents are, Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. And God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look at who your dad and mom was to decide if he'll bless you. Thank God dads and moms and grandpas and grandmas that are godly can influence the next generation for right. But if you didn't have that influence, you can say, may the Lord help me. We'll be the first generation in our family that will live for God and leave a lasting heritage. You can be that one. Dad, you can be that type of dad. You said I didn't have that dad, but you can be that. Mm. A generation's influenced. You are influencing them now. You are influencing them now, right now. Conclusion this morning, a generation is influenced by the faith of those before them. But they themselves must step out in faith and faith God for themselves. Look, when you read the word Be Beersheba, that may not mean anything to you this morning, but if you start studying back, Beersheba is the home place. This is where he's at. This is where he builds the altar here. This is Beersheba, he said, the Bible says there. This is where dad woke up Isaac that morning when he said, come on, Isaac, we're going to the land of Mount Moriah there to offer sacrifice for God. And this is where they came back to those days later after God had showed himself mighty God and provided himself a lamb, that ram caught in a thicket. But now dad's gone. It's not the same because dad's not there. It was Isaac's turn to seek the Lord and trust God for water and protection and, and make dad's God his God. Now, let me ask you just for a second, as you think about our church, about Gospel Light Baptist Church. It started in 2002. The rented building was there for five years, in that rented building. Let me just ask you this morning, how many of you were here when this building was built five years after Gospel Light Baptist Church had started, how many of you were here when this building was built and this property purchased? Would you stand? You were here? Go ahead and stand if you were here. Yeah, the Hydes were here, but they weren't here today. Isn't that interesting? Thank you. You can be seated. How many of you were not here when the decision was made to buy this property and launch out in faith to build this building? You were not here. Would you stand? Sorry. Some of you needed to stand up anyway. I'm with you. I wasn't here either. I just want you to think of me for a second. We are standing literally on this property and in this building on the faith of another generation. We are being influenced actively in this moment by the generation before us. Listen, their faith has encouraged us. As we've seen what God doing, we've heard the stories of, of how the church started and how God worked and how this property came to be and how the man gave us two acres and that became the collateral so we could buy the other four acres from him. And all of that, we're standing on the faith and the miracle of that. We're standing on that. It's encouraged us of God's leading and direction in this church and all that God has done. But now it's our turn. Now it's our turn, like Isaac, to step out in faith and see our God, who is mighty <laughs> and able God, able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. It's our turn. Will you be the next generation that entreats 
God, that prays, that seeks, that supplicates God? Or will you look at all this? Will you hear all the stories of what God has done and turn and walk away? An infidel. You young people, I'm especially thinking of you. You may be seated there. May the Lord help us to believe that he is who he says he is. The great I am, the almighty God is who he says he is. Acts 13, 36 says this, For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid on his fathers and saw corruption. May God use us. May we serve our generation by the will of God. Let's bow in prayer.